Hey, what's going on? Coach Luca here with the Vigor Life Podcast. And uh, this is uh, a man I've been kind of, we're kind of going back and forth, trying to make this happen. Finally, it's here, damn it. Uh, <laughs> early in the morning, we're both getting caffeinated right now to make sure that we're on point. Uh, but so, yeah, uh, if you hear any pauses, it's us drinking caffeine. So <laughs> yeah, that's the only pauses you're going to get right now. Uh, but it's, it's my pleasure uh, to have Chris Duffin here on the show, man. Uh, it is, it's, it's such a pleasure, man, and honor to have you on the show. Uh, and we got so much to talk about. Like I said, this this is uh, definitely not going to be a straight shot. Uh, like if you have guys have not heard about Chris Duffin, maybe you heard about him because, you know, from squatting a thousand pounds for, for a triple or sumo deadlift over a thousand for a triple or a lot of the amazing, you know, strength feats that he's done. Maybe you've heard about him because of Kabuki Strength, which is a great company that makes the best for, for I think it's the best equipment, the best bars um, out there for training. Or it could be the education side of Kabuki. There's a lot. Maybe it's the book and uh, that I just got started reading, diving in, and um, I would say it's it's phenomenal so far. But but Chris has an amazing story, and and what I love about you know you and the stuff that you talk about is essentially you know going from where you were, like and what happened to you is not who you are and how you can recreate yourself and essentially build whatever you want. And that's where I wanted to start this. Um, yeah. You know, that's, I, I always try to preface that because it's like, when you talk about it, it's like people are like, well, I have to have that crazy backstory to be able to have, you know, that drive. And it's like, no, no, the whole point is you define who you are every day. Your past is, you know, it's a subset of experiences and things, but your choice going forward from today is is where where you're at and uh so and I, I developed that in a lot of my philosophies around life and business under you know a unique uh, upbringing i had so the uh the elevator uh, version i guess it'll be longer than the elevator version <laughs> but uh i i grew up homeless and in the mountains basically so for much of my upbringing northern california and then into oregon and my uh my my parents were they're incredibly intelligent uh, actually, my father was a member of Mensa and um, yeah, they were just they just didn't want to be part of society. So my mom had dropped out of uh, uh, college to become a chemical engineer and decided that she was going to, well, grow pot for a living. You know, understand this is in the 70s. It wasn't legal then. And uh, so we moved into the mountains and w they didn't want to have any part of, you know, government, society. So it was a lot of you know, living in tents uh, during the winter, we'd come into uh, housing to get to school, but oftentimes it lacked electricity or running water. Uh, there were times that food was really short. I mean, I remember one winter watching my mom and uh, and my stepdad just wither away because, you know, we had a 50 pound bag of rice, 50 pound bag of beans and any meat, you know, they fed to us kids and they, they chose to uh to not eat so that we would be able to eat and that was until the uh the weevils infested the rice but that uh, was a <laughs> i think i called it maggots in my book and my mom correct she knows she's like you know there's so many errors in your book <laughs> those were weevils i'm like okay mom they were weevils <laughs> i got it <laughs> thanks for the correction <laughs> and uh and and just a lot of uh experiences you know like at six years old i was I was taught how to catch and handle rattle, live rattlesnakes because we were living, well, you know, we had beams lashed up into the trees. Um, this is in Northern California, you know, rattlesnakes were all over the place and there was a couple dens by us. And so, you know, we had to sleep up off the ground, but we didn't have housing. And so that's, uh, that's what we did. And I learned how to forage for mushrooms. I was fishing to, you know, uh, all the way through high school, you know, I'd go out and fish the creek every day and pull pull fish or catch grasshoppers and feed them onto my hook uh, to uh, to help prepare dinner. And just a lot of interesting experiences. Obviously, you meet some pretty unsavory characters uh, when people don't, I don't think, really understand, like, when you're away from the rules and bounds or the perception that you're away from that, uh, people are different, and you have to be prepared, I guess. It's also where people that don't want to be found are. are. So, you know, there's encounters with murderers. Um, we lived in a community that was, it was uh, preyed on by a, a, a 
pedophile uh, human trafficking ring, which is, uh, you know, that's, I'll leave that story for the book. Uh, it's a little hard for me to talk about. Um, uh, a serial killer uh, stalked uh, the family for a while. Um, there's some crazy stuff, some crazy experiences. I got taken by the state for a while. Uh, and then we picked back up in Oregon uh, where the parents decided, well, we can't lose the kids again after a losing them for a year. And they uh, uh, got out of the uh, the drug trade. Uh, and, you know, on the very bottom end of growing, there's not much actually for you uh, there. And it's hit or miss. It's big payday once a year. And um, but uh, <clears throat> so we ended up in in Oregon and I. I. Uh, I, I, I excelled like when I got to high school, finally had a, a stable place. We had a, a mobile home, double wide mobile home. It was falling apart, but it was something that uh, we were able to live in consistently for the course of my high school. And I excelled in sports and the academics, uh, got a full ride scholarship to go to school, uh, academics. Um, I was supposed to go wrestle at Oregon State, but I decided, hey, money's nice. Uh, and security, like, I don't know if I'd go to college. I was, you know, just going to wait tables in the local, uh, even, you know, I, I didn't know much about like loans and mm -hmm. app, like all that stuff that, you know, your, your parents could give you confidence and help coach you through. My parents didn't have experience with that. They were smart, but they didn't know how things worked. And, and so, uh, I chose to go that route. And then uh, things got worse at home when I went away. So a lot of the time growing up, I was the one actually uh, raising uh, my sisters uh, while the parents were out, you know, either tending crops or in Oregon, uh, mining and, and working, uh, uh, working the timber industry. So I was, I was managing the, uh, well, not the house, but the, the camp. <laughs> uh, and uh, things got worse when I left. And so I ended up taking custody of my three younger sisters. I raised all them. Uh, while I got my engineering degrees and I still had one of them. No, two, actually, no, it was still two as I was pursuing uh, my MBA and working. Obviously, I worked full time through uh, all my college experiences. How old were you when you um, uh, took custody? I think I was 21, maybe okay. when I when I first uh, when I when I first took custody. So it was about 21 through 30 uh, was the time frame I had my sister's. Uh, so that was time I was finishing out, like I said, uh, I was working on a dual engineering degree and then I, I was already working full time in management at the, at, at the time in the uh, manufacturing world. And so I jumped in, moved to the big city of Portland, uh, jumped into my MBA and then, uh, I, I found out this strangely enough, this, uh, this quiet introverted kid that never talked to anybody growing up was actually able to connect with people uh on an authentic level and somehow that actually works pretty good on leadership you know not the the raw raw motivational i'm like why am i in this position this is not what i thought people you know <laughs> first out so it took me a long time to figure out why i was successful but i i ended up uh within a short period of time within 10 years i was at the executive level and i was uh sought after for coming in and basically turning around companies, uh, divisions of companies, uh, taking companies from, you know, a regional to a global or international. Uh, my biggest, most successful one, I took a, an aerospace company that was uh, going to lose its Boeing contract, which was like 80% of its work. Uh, it was failing for quality, failing for delivery, and uh, losing money. <laughs> And uh, everybody there was going to lose their job. I turned it around, became the best supplier in the world uh, to Boeing for both quality and delivery, financially positive, and then walked it through uh, to a successful sale to resolve the uh, financial issue. So that was a uh, that took four years. That was pretty fun. Oh, and I, oh, I lifted weights and owned a gym all on the side. <laughs> <laughs> you Started lifting weights in 1988, actually. <laughs> and it's it's just so like it's such an amazing story. What, I, what you know what I'm curious about is like what in that time frame from when you were a kid, what do you think that helped you, you know, excel and not go down, you know, even when you went to school and you, you work hard and studied and, you know, then went to and got an engineering degree and so on and so forth. Like, what do you think it was from kind of just the principles of life standpoint that you didn't go down, you know, a, a negative route 
self-destructive and all those ways, you know, because it could be, you know, your story. I, and I wrote that line at times. I talk about that in my book, too. Um, yeah. But I, uh, you know, I dealt with a lot of depression, uh, alcohol abuse, things like that. But the the thing that kept me like I, I, I watch people around me die growing up, making the wrong choices, ending up there. Uh, and so I really saw it as those were, it wasn't failure. It was, it was death at the other end. It was complete as well. Like there's no, I, you ever heard the term burning bridges? Yeah. I had no couch to go home and crash on or bedroom or anything like that. Everything was on me. And I think also the survivor, um, you know, mentality of the fact that I was always responsible for other people kind of helped force that. Um, but it's, to me, it's, it's really helped build this, this belief that you've got two ways to go in life and where it's the human condition. We adapt to stress either positively or negatively. If I do CrossFit seven days a week, twice a day, I'm going to go on a downhill course, right? I just picked, it wasn't CrossFit specific, but, uh, um, <laughs> but, uh, we had, that's, that's the human condition. You know, if, if we quit, if you break your arm and you put a cast on it, it starts to atrophy, starts to wither and die without use, without stress. That's the process. So, so we've got two opportunities. We, we adapt. And so both physically, mentally, emotionally, all these things, we have to have stress and challenge in our life, which is the antithesis of what we're always trying to find, which is comfort. And comfort is what the, we don't need because that is that that thing. So it's this balance. You've also got to be able, as I, I, I kind of uh, uh, referred to there, be able to rest and recover from these things. Um, and so I, I learned these lessons, I guess, really early. And, and then, you know, this confidence in myself and my abilities uh, definitely, you know, helped me believing that I could actually pull this stuff off believing I could be successful and just talking myself into that, even though, again, like I said, I was, uh, you know, bouncing around new, new school every year within the school year. Like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the greatest, greatest, uh, socially, you know, people made fun of me because my clothes and feet sticking out the side of my shoes and stuff like that. But, uh, so definitely feeds into some self-confidence issues with that. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you know, in some areas that you can feel that, that you can't feel like, I'm, I'm going to try this. And if I fail, that's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt me because I'm going to try it again and I'm going to get there uh, and not, uh, not expecting, you know, success to just drop at your feet on the very first, uh, first step. So it's, it's a lot of, and that's, that's what I wrote the book for was uh, really covering. It's not a book about, oh my, woe is me. Uh, you're already into it, Luca. It's it's written very specifically to ask you questions of introspection. I don't have any answers. I can't tell you how to live, but you need to deep dive deep and really understand some of the drivers. And so the book slowly walks you through this process and every chapter is aimed around some specific lessons. And then it starts in the end, really wrapping and pulling all this together. Uh, but it it, to me, like, you know, just being driven in the long term is what's going to it's going to take that and knowing uh, who you are and where you want to go are going to be those big things. You know, it's, it's great to listen to a motivational speech and get all pumped up. And that may last for a while and help you through some phases. But, you know, you've got to really understand as a human being, like, what are your values? What are your drivers? Who and how do you want to live and be in the world? And from that, that's going to help create, you know, all these different paths and the and the motivation and drive to to stick with it through the hard times and and, and the tough times uh, to to see it out and uh, and living in the way that you want to live. And that's I'm kind of walking all over theory, philosophy here, really fast, all well, over the yeah, place. But I, like, do you have some like, for instance, you know, when because when you talk about that, like, who do you want to become and your values and everything is. On a daily and weekly basis, are there stuff that you do? You know, there's a lot of people that, that do the, you know, 17 things in their morning ritual. I'm not one of them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but but it's like there are things that, you know, behaviors and, and habits yeah, yeah. Feel like have really helped you, 
you know, throughout this process, even if you look back, you know, kind of decades, but what, what's helping you even now stay on course for that? Yeah, uh, I'll walk through a couple things. So one of them is just creating space. So you've got to have time to just think about things, to think about what have I done? What were the outcomes of that? What am I looking to accomplish next? Where am I? It's so easy, especially when you're stressed out to feel just like I need to do stuff. I'm working. I'm getting stuff done. I'm checking things off my list, right? That's even the, the seven. I, I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do, right? Um, so, you know, like when I worked in, the, you know, the executive environment, like I would block out my schedule every Friday afternoon, no meetings, no nothing. And it was my time to think. <laughs> it was to think about the what how, how the week went to what my plan was, what I'm going to be working on next week, uh, and then be thinking bigger picture long term, like uh, about the struggles and things that needed to happen in the business. And it's just so easy for people. I'd always come in and take over for people because it was always a failing you know enterprise, right? So it's something that it wasn't for lack of effort or wanting. It's really rare that people don't they'd be running around you know, working 12, 14 hour days, six, seven days a week, right? Getting shit done like crazy. And I would come in and do nothing. <laughs> right. That's there's a tagline a, right there. <laughs> but there's a process to this, right? Because yeah. I needed to really understand what the primary, you know, objectives that things that needed to happen for the business. And I also need to find out what's just busy work, right? So there's a process here. Um, it's, uh, I, I kind of developed it a little bit out of, uh, what's called five S which is like a workplace thing. And it's like, you strip everything out of a work area and then you slowly start adding back. You'll find what are the things I have to have. And those are only things you put in there and you put them right at point of reach. So you can be very efficient. Well, quit doing everything in your life. And pretty quickly, you're going to find out, well, shit, I got to do the laundry, you know, <laughs> but you'd be surprised at how many things are on your daily you know, list, weekly list, things that you just doing all the time that feel that just don't need to be done. So first step is just stripping that stuff away and just don't do the things that are essential for the direction and where you want to go in life and what you're trying to accomplish. They may be good things. You may want to do them. You may enjoy them. And with that last piece, there's a time for, to pull that in as well. But it's understanding what is essential. And that's why you got to really understand what your values are first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm the antithesis to bucket lists. Okay. <laughs> I think it's nonsense. <laughs> There's random shit that I want to, Oh, that looks cool. Let's add this, this, and this. And I got a hundred things that I want to do in my life. Bullshit. <laughs> get, get some structure and get some clarity. Okay. So first step is remove it and find out what you have to do. And you'd be, especially in a work environment, you'd be fine. How much reporting and, you know, paperwork and all this stuff just actually doesn't need to get done. Okay. And second piece from there is, okay, now that you found that uh, it has to be done is, can I automate it? Can I put something in place that just make this get done without any work? And then the last one is, okay, I can't do that. Maybe it's delegating it. Uh, again, like, if I, if my vehicle has some, uh, I, you know, automotive problems on it, I'll take it to the mechanic I trust to work on it. I have the full capability of doing it myself. People are, Why are you doing that? You're paying so much extra money. Don't you like turning wrenches? I'm like, no, I like creating. I like fabricating. So anybody that follows me knows like I basically build vehicles from the ground up, like, yeah. but they're one off. It's unique. It's all engineered. I don't want to go change the brakes on on my wife's mercedes <laughs> i just had that done last week the dealer okay because that's not a good value proposition from what i want to do okay uh and so it's those are the three things and once you do that you'll start finding time now in your life for that introspection the thinking about things and how they fit in and and, and really you know understanding that and that's so let's let's take to the next step the other so the next step is the introspection piece okay and this is the things that you you know you've got your bucket list you've got your things here things that you want in life ask yourself why you want it 
Okay. It was a tough question right there, but yeah, I'm going to win. Uh, hey, I want to go back to school. Why? I'm not telling you not to, but why? There's so many different reasons of why. Could be credibility. Could be for continue. You know, I just want to learn more. It could be I want this career. Well, well, why do you want this career? Why do you want to learn in this area? Why do you feel that you need credibility? Okay. And you get your answers. Might take a few weeks to work through this stuff. And then you ask yourself, why? <laughs> okay. And you keep diving, digging. You go at least five layers deep. The process is called the five whys. Mm -hmm. But pick the things that you really want in life and just keep peeling back the layers and you'll finally get to these things that aren't a thing anymore. Okay. I want a, I want a fancy house. There's a lot of reasons that people could want a fancy house. It could be, um, it could be a, a, an image perception thing. It could be, I use this example because uh, understand it could be security. Like knowing I've worked hard enough, and this is the example I actually use in my book, to, to, to have these nice things, which knows that I can now, if I have that, I know that I can you know, have a great care of my family. Uh, that they're secure, no worries. Well, if you don't know that, all you know is I want these things. And so you could over leverage yourself to get those things and actually do the opposite of what you want to accomplish. That's really freaking important to understand the whys, because once you understand the true why, now you could start seeing like, I want to be an NFL player. Uh, you, you lost your knee in high school. I guess your life's over. I'm going to be depressed. And where am I going to go? Well, if you we understood why you wanted to be that NFL player, you could, under, you could start creating so many alternative paths that would realize those same nuggets. Okay. And so it, it should be getting down into, uh, I'll list some of, you know, list some of my personal values to give you a flavor of what these things uh, should, should be, right? Um, I want to have a creative outlet in my life. Creativity is a value for me, okay? I want to be recognized. If I do hard work, I want to have recognition. Some people don't need that. I, I'll be honest. Like. I I do, yeah, you know, there's, there's ego in there. Like, yeah, admit it. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no good or bad things. Just understand these things about yourself. Okay. I want to always be learning. Okay. I want challenge. Oh, could you guess that about me? No, yeah. no, no, not, not no. You, or competition, I guess. <laughs> competitive, like competitive challenge. Like, uh, yeah. Like I kind of strive, I thrive on this environment, right? That's why I did the things that I did. But guess what? If I freaking hurt myself in the end and didn't accomplish my big squat, I'd be on to other things, not necessarily even squatting. What am I doing today? Mm, let's see. I've launched, let's see, Kabuki Strength, which is a globally recognized brand <laughs> within five years launched two other companies in addition to that, in addition to my writing, and I'm about ready to launch another one. Of the three main companies that I launched, um, all three of them, you know, hit seven figures in revenue within their first two years, okay? I, that's competitive outlet for me. Mm -hmm. I'm able to structure it and go, this is my new enterprise, right? This is the thing, this is the challenge, this is where I'm going. And I'm learning in the process, right? Uh, and all the things I've got to do to, uh, to take that on. Um, so it, when we understand that, it's a lot easier to, to, to really start go choosing where we go in life. So these are, these are some bigger picture things that, you know, it's not me sitting down all the time to do it. And, uh, but once you understand your values, like process, you know, almost every evening, I sit down with my wife, either in bed or in the hot tub, and uh, we sit there and chat about our shared values in life and what, where we're going and all the things that fit in and how we're piecing this together. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's a constantly shifting plan, but uh, is, you know, little revisions here and there and pushing, but it's, you know, we're, we're sitting there planning, you know, next month, six months out, five years out, 10 years out. 
20 years out, like we have a, a vision that we're trying to piece together and put with all those working pieces. And it's just, a, uh, you know, we have to have that understanding of ourselves and where we're aligned together to do that. Um, and uh, so that's something I, I make time for. It's a constant piece, just like the the introspection, you don't get there and go, here's my values and then the process is done. You should always be challenging it and always seeking and trying to find more or just digging it in different ways. Uh, and things, uh, you as a person kind of change over time as well. So mm -hmm. it's not like, hey, uh, Sunday afternoon, I'm gonna figure this out, we're gonna move forward. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> That's such a great point because I mean, it, you're basically talking about like your your North Star, your compass, right? Yeah, like, exactly, like, yep. And, um, I don't know if you ever heard of, and when you started talking about how much time you spend thinking, you know, and even when you work for companies and now um, there's a great book by uh, Keith J. Cunningham. It's called the, the Road Less Stupid. I love the title too, The Road Less Stupid. And he talks about thinking time. You know, it was the first time I was just like, oh, I do this, but it's, it's great. Like you take time to ask yourself these questions. It's probably the most valuable stuff that you can do, you know, it is. rather than just and like waltzing through. The day and and the thing home. is, especially when you're stressed out and stuff, people revert to like feeling of getting things done, yep. but it may not be moving it forward. You know, like when I, when I would do a turnaround and I'd really discover, you know, the issues and stuff that were wrong with the business and, you know, I'd start taking action. You know what a lot of it was me walking around and talking to people. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'd figure out kind of where we'd want to go, that North Star, and I'd start verbally painting a picture of it. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go around to department heads, to people at all levels in the organization, and start painting the picture with them in it, how they fit into it, what their role was, how it would feel, okay? This, this is great, because I, I, I know you're, I don't know if you, or purposely going there, but it's like, this is leadership. And it's like, and actually it's one of the questions that I wanted to lead into, but you know, you're, you're talking about leadership and a lot of, do you like in, in, in your mind off at the top of the head, could you go like, Hey, what are some of the most important, you know, cause you've led people and, and took care, took responsibility, you know, from a, from a young age, obviously, but what, if you had to like extract kind of like you extract your values, you know, what would you say are, are some of these most important factors when it comes to you know, leading people because you've yep. done it through all types of different, not only, you know, levels of life, but organizations. Uh, <laughs> there's so many small things that add up. I'm actually working on another book called uh, <laughs> Leadership Fundamentals, the, oh, the Unconventional uh, Executive's Guide to Leadership Fundamentals, Goal Setting and Execution. So it's actually putting all that together. Um, but authenticity. So but there's so many things that feed into authenticity that come into all your interactions all the time via shit, simple shit, like how you listen to people, right? Doing and following through on what you say that you're going to do. Like all these that will feed into this when people come to you and you're speaking to them to be able to tell them the truth and they believe you. And it could be, it's really important because the truth may be you're doing a great job, but people won't hear that. Okay. But if you get there and to that point and you're very specific about this, people will, they get a lot more from it. Hey, I just want you to know that you're doing a tremendous job and that it's having X, Y, Z output. And I really appreciate it. I want you to hear me. Okay. But it also means when you come to somebody, you don't have to, if, if you know, you're not getting the, uh, the, what you expect, that it doesn't have to be a, a beating a person up thing. It could be a very simple conversation of, you know, where you come in and you're like, I'm sorry to tell you this, but, you know, I'm just, I'm disappointed with the results that we're seeing here. I think that you can accomplish a lot more and I expect more to happen. Um, and you're going to get, you don't have to like, I'm going to write you up. You're going to need to do this or you're going to lose your job. But the fact of, if you have that trust 
And that when you cut, when you put somebody and you say, personally, you have to own it again for authenticity, you need to own everything. It's not, well, corporate says this, our handbook says this. People love to do that because it's easier on them. I don't freaking give a rat's ass if that is exactly there. You say, my expectation, my expectation is this, okay? And you're not meeting that expectation, all right? But I believe that you can. I know that you can accomplish this. And if there's anything in the way that I can help you in accomplishing this, I want to help you. I, I want to be there to let me know what it is, how I can assist. But at the end of the day, this is what I need to have happen. Okay. Own every bit of it and be authentic. And you also got to care that I want this person to fix or resolve whatever the issue is. Okay. And voice that. All right. Um, that could even be in a meeting where you're deciding to part ways. Okay. It could be that same exact simple conversation. You know, it's unfortunate that you chose to, to not, you know, step up and accomplish this and this and this, but uh, I really want you to do well in your career. And I know that you've got the potential and I'm wishing you the best as you do that. Okay. I have had in the course of my career, multiple people that I have let go that have come back to work for me again, that have requested one instance, the individual I kept telling them, no, I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to hire you because you performed this, this, and this. And he's like, I understand. He's like, but I'm going to keep coming. And he did for six months. <laughs> uh, he's like, I have something to prove to you. You were right. I was in a bad spot in my life. And I was, I was negatively affecting uh, everyone around me. And I worked there for 25 years and nobody called me on my shit. And you did. He's well, like, that's, that's a I want to come work for you. You changed my life. I've had, I've had like this, this happened over and over and over again. Like it's on my Facebook post. I'll post something and somebody will come back like, and say that like, it's crazy. I've had employees work for me. I've never held, well, outside of Kabuki, I guess Kabuki is my longest paying uh, job now at five years, my longest job at five years now. <laughs> um, but usually four to five years was the max. Uh, three to four years was I'd do my work and I'd be bored and on to the next thing. Um, but I've had employees work for me for 15 years, <laughs> wow. right? I've got, when I launched Kabuki, you know how I did it? I needed stuff done. I'd reach out to, hey, here's an engineering manager that worked for me. Here's this person. And they, I'd task them on the side and they're like, yeah, I'd love, love to do it. And, uh, and you just, you, you, you've got to have that connection. I, I'm a little off topic, but I think these are, no, these, are important, these are important things. I mean, it's actually really eye opening for a, uh, there's a documentary kind of being done about the squad in my life a little bit. And the guy doing the documentary, he's, he's like, I, he's like, I can't believe he's like every single person I've reached out to. He's like, some of these people are flying in from, you know, across the nation during the course of the squad, just to help me out. Like, Hey, I need this. Somebody will fly in from Boston. Somebody will fly up from LA to help me with whatever it was I needed the course of that. And he'd interview them and, and they'd be, he's like, everybody says the same thing anything for Chris because it was finally in a time in my life I'm starting to ask back but it's always been how do I give how do I give so authenticity being able to connect and there's so many pieces that feed into this but you can you can just leapfrog over people uh, with this because now you combine this with another piece storytelling okay if you can tell the story that's painting a picture, right? Where we're going and getting that connection. Combine those two, two together and now you've got some magic. Now throw in some basic business knowledge and other things and you can really propel things uh, forward. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of really small conversations within this. I mean, this is, sure. uh, that's, <laughs> that's about uh, six or seven chapters worth of content to dive into all the little uh, the, the pieces that make that up. Uh, but, uh, and it, it just seems so like stupid, Chris, you're going to talk about like how to listen to people. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You'd be amazed at how many, uh, managers out there. I say the word managers 
are incredibly horrible leaders. It, it, it's such an easy thing to do right too. It just comes down to treating people well, right? Being able to have a vision and communicate that with people in the process. Having honest and open conversations as it's moving forward, right? Um, it's a quick question too. Like for, when you were going through this, you know, process and improving as a leader and getting better at communication and connection and storytelling, what was your? Because you, you said one of the, uh, the thing is, I'm not. A, I'm here's the thing. I'll just say I'm going to cut. I'll, we'll get back to your question uh, because this also ties into a huge topic on entrepreneurship that I just gave a presentation to my old college on. Uh, it's around the relationships. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and it's all the same stuff, right? But, but um, I'm, I'm not very super, uh, articulate or polished or, you know, those things that like CEO quality or big speaker, I'm rough around the edges. I stumble over words. I doesn't matter. It doesn't, you don't have to have that. You've got to have you. Well, I mean, that's, but you're, but you're as authentic as they come though. <laughs> and, and that's, and, 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 and that's what you have to have. Like I said, I don't need to be, I don't, I, I, I there, here I am, you know, uh, <laughs> that, I, that's not, that's not me. And you don't have to have that. Okay. And that's sometimes the perception that you, that you have to have those things. Relationships are, they're everything in life. Okay. And uh, being able to develop those uh, real relationships, it's an art to it. It's not about sending a message to someone on LinkedIn. Hey, I want to connect. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to, you know, like, whatever. Like, that's not, <laughs> those aren't real relationships. Showing up at a, at a convention, uh, you know, or a meet, an industry meet and greet where you're handing out business cards and like chit-chatting. Those aren't relationships, okay? If you foster, and people are working and they'll try to build hundreds of these, whatever. If you spend the time and try to develop five, five relationships with industry leaders in your field, you can accomplish nearly anything. Now, that's hard to do. And there's an art to doing that, but uh, I'll hand that back to your question I interrupted. No, Poor no. leadership skills and walk right over the conversation, you know. <laughs> hey, Chris, talk about listening. Oh, well, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you have to jump in and make a point, which I, which I appreciate, man. But it was, it, I, was I was thinking about, because one of your values is learning. But as you went up, how, like, I, I know for me, sometimes if I'm, you know, I, I learn number one from people, definitely from people, but also from, you know, whether it's a book or a course or anything like that. Like, if you ever got stuck and said, hey, listen, how do I become a better communicator? You know, do you go out and, reach out to somebody you feel is a great communicator? Do you, do you read a book? Are you learning from watching people most of the time? What was, what, you know, what was that kind of a path where you're like, you know what, I gotta get better at this. What do you go and do? Yeah. So um, a lot of times I'm reaching out to people. Uh, I'm really terrible at being able to sit down. Um, I just recently got an office because I don't even sit down for a computer. I'm always running, you know, adult ADHD. Uh, and uh, I just recognize that. And like, I don't have the time or the attention span to really focus on that. And I learn really great uh, in person. Um, but not everybody can do that. So it's, it's uh, but, they, but they can. It just takes a different level of work, right, to, uh, to, to accomplish that. Um, but I, I prefer one-on-one -on -one coaching, mentoring. Uh, I've been members of groups. I've had people as mentors. Uh, I've always developed a relationship with someone to mentor me in any of these different aspects in my life. Um, as I've, as I've, as I've grown in my adult life, I didn't have any mentors when I was a child. And that's when I read a lot. Yeah. <laughs> So it's just been kind of a, a shift. This actually just works better for me and I'm in a position to kind of do that. Um, but I did a lot of reading when I was younger, like just massive amount, but I just, uh, I don't do that as much anymore. So that's, that's just my preferred approach. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, everybody's different on that side, but I, I just think I wanted to pull it out that, you know, how important it is that 
you are co- constantly doing it, whether it's getting one-on-one mentoring, whether it's, oh my. you know, it's- uh, constantly. Well, and I'm reading research pieces and short articles. Uh, I've got that. And I, I'm doing that multiple times a day. Like con- it's basically constant. Like my wife's always like, what, what are you at? And I'm like, Oh, I'm reading up on this piece. Well, you know, like here, it's a really interesting piece of research. She's like, Oh, okay. <laughs> where, where, where does, where does all, I mean, where does the strength training fit in? Cause I, cause I want to kind of mold together where the strength yeah. training fits in and then how, you know, how Kabuki got created. Um, yeah. Where did, where does strength training start for you? What was kind of like the, the trigger to go like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to lift weights. You know, what, yeah. what was the reasoning behind all that? So my, my stepfather, uh, was, uh, definitely, uh, you know, loved physical culture. Um, uh, he came from a family that, um, was uh, kind of well off. Everybody, all his brothers went on to be attorneys and, and, you know, doctors. And I never met them because he didn't like them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he was a incredibly, he was a genius uh, himself uh, on the artistic front. Uh, couldn't really manage life. Uh, but uh, um, he, he'd always preach, you know, that you've got to have both a strong mind and a strong back. Like, and that he had, he was, he'd always uh, talk down about my dad for being a member of Mensa. And, uh, but he'd be like, you need to do, you know, you need to be physical. Uh, and, you know, he was mining and logging and doing all these sorts of, you know, tasks in life. Um, but also constantly reading, like nonstop. That's all, all he, that's actually all we did growing up that's what we had was a library like it was i'm when i said i read a lot i mean as a family like that's what we did by candlelight by flashlight like all the time because we didn't have tv we didn't have radio we didn't this was our thing and it was like hey we're in a new area we're going to learn about geology next thing you know we're mining uh my mother uh was also she she a uh, you know, was the, she was, went to a high school that had like 1500 kids and she was the student athlete, uh, award when she graduated. Um, she was at the time her school didn't have women could compete in the Olympics, but her school didn't have track and field. And she'd try to compete because she could out throw, uh, all the men at discus, wow. uh, and she wanted to just compete and they wouldn't let her even though she was basically, I think she was throwing at about 10 feet less than the women's Olympic discus throwers were throwing uh, in high school. Um, so she's, she's athletically just a powerhouse and I got a lot of her genes. Um, so it's always been there. And uh, so I, uh, you know, obviously usual reasons and somebody in junior high would start lifting, which is look good for the women girls and uh, uh, self-confidence um, and uh, that's why I started but before that I mean I was I was <laughs> chopping chopping wood I was hiking up the side of mountains with like you know on all fours with you know 100 200 pounds of rock in my back like that's what I grew up so it was a pretty natural I was used to the this physical outlet right and uh and my, and my stepfather uh, encouraged the lifting because that's something he did a lot when he was younger. And so I just started with doing uh, push-ups and jump squats until failure, like every night, hundreds and hundreds until my like, I, I couldn't move the next day from doms, uh, running with uh, ankle weights. And then, uh, then I started, uh, I think, right, I don't know if it was junior high or like freshman year, I started combing the nickel ads because I was, you know, chopping wood and mowing lawns and stuff for money and then i buy the cheap uh the hollow bar with the oh, yeah. uh the concrete weights that were rubber and ca- that were plastic encased all crackling apart because i'd find it you know <laughs> that in that condition i'd throw it up on a it was uh, on the back uh back porch off of our uh, mobile home i built myself my own gym and started training there and it just uh it's just always been part of my life. And it was a huge confidence boost for me to go, especially as this kid that had no connections to all of a sudden like, Oh, Hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I, I, I'm a sports star in high school. Like I have all these like 
friends, you know, now in this, like it just, it was a really positive experience uh, for me and a big connection that I had with the iron. And so that's been with me my whole life. I stopped for a couple of years in college uh, when I was drinking way too much and, uh, and then uh, restarted uh, while still in college. So it was just a brief break, like I think it was a year and a half or two years. And around 2000, I started powerlifting. Uh, I saw some power bodybuilders in the gym uh, prepping for a show. And I was like, wow, they're bigger and look better than me, but I run circles around them way stronger. I'm like, let me find a lifting competition. I'm going to do one just to say I did it because they're prepping for this thing. And I did it and I was like, oh, well, that I'm doing that for the rest of my life. That was fun. <laughs> so uh, it was a bench press and deadlift. And I'm like, then I found out about powerlifting. I'm like, oh, I better learn to squat. So, uh, <clears throat> and I wanted, so I ended up, building my own home gym because I got kicked out of all the commercial stuff because of the weights I was moving and, you know, just all the normal nonsense. And uh, so I built my own place and people started coming over to train. And then uh, when was this? When did you, when did you build your own place? Uh, 2000 started around 2003 and was training full time in it by probably 2000 five or six oh, wow so it's been 15 years you've had your own spot okay yeah and then i uh, started having other people uh come over that's when my youtube i started my youtube channel in late 2006 which you'll find these really awful lifting videos posted almost daily uh uh from then uh, from my basement and it moved from my basement to my driveway to my garage and then around 2008 or nine uh, me and uh, Rudy Cadlove, my business partner, uh, decided that we were going to open a facility because he was a high-level executive himself. Uh, this is actually when I was running the aerospace company. And we we decided on three things. Like, we wanted to be, it was selfish. We wanted to be the best athletes in the world of what we, in what we were doing. And to do that, I felt we needed three things. We needed the right equipment, the right methods, and the right environment. So we started a gym to create our own environment and our own culture. We had all these rules in place to instill, you know, make sure our members were aligned with that. But we found out after a while we didn't need to have rules because those were the only people that would make it past the front door because it'd be like, what the fuck is this place? So we're like, oh, we don't need a screening. <laughs> our gym is the screening, okay. And uh, then we uh, moved in 2012 to a 9,000 square foot facility. Uh, first one was 4,000 in like this total ghetto area, rain through the light bulbs that were hanging off wires from the, you know, like it was, it was a disaster, but it worked. And then we moved to a 9,000 square foot facility. The whole time building the gym, I was building all the equipment. I've got a machine shop. I've got all this background in manufacturing and I'm a tinker. I've like, I'm always seeking perfection. Yeah, some probably tie that to some sort of maybe value uh, somewhere anyway but at this point in time you're not thinking hey i'm gonna i'm gonna build a company that does these things though. i actually thought about so actually back in 2008 i was gonna launch one uh, i designed the super lift uh, which is the uh, uh this like a monolift thing but yeah. you could do every barbell thing in the world switches both sides the arms extend goes from the floor to eight feet up blah, blah. anyway uh i was gonna partner with mark bell uh and he was gonna do the advertising and and, and, and marketing side of it. And I was going to do the manufacturing. Uh, we made four units. I think I bought most of them back. There's one, I think floating around in Washington somewhere still. Um, but, uh, that's when I realized the aerospace company was going under and I'm like, I just can't I'm like, Mark, I, I, I can't do this. I, I thought, said I was going to do it. I can't follow through on this commitment. And, uh, so I walked away from that. So it's always been in the back of my head for a long time. And then um, in 2015, it was getting to the point that I just couldn't continue anymore with like this high performance, very stressful career. My kids were getting older. They're going to be getting in sports. I'm also training at a really high level with these crazy goals. Uh, I've also got my hobbies. So I got family. I got career. I got hobbies and I got lifting four things I'm like I can't do this one of these I have to finally quit my wife or ex-wife now uh, had told me for years I had to quit lifting 
Well, I decided it was quit careering. <laughs> so I quit my job uh, and uh, started launching the products that I designed. So the first one being the shoulder rock, because it was very unique. Nobody was really mace swinging at the time. Mm -hmm. Now that whole thing's back and there's all these companies. I'm like, I realized I got popular from somewhere, you know, a little bit of ego here, but. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, I launched it with that in a, a whiskey and deadlift shirt based on a oh, yeah, pseudoscience, I I pseudoscience article I wrote on the, the powers of whiskey as a performance and dancing aid. But if read it, if you doubt me, read it. Uh, I call, I call pseudoscience, but you'll you'll realize. No, I read it. Right. I, I, it I, it works. It, I probably would say eh, I don't know that maybe that was one of the first times I, I saw the video floating around when you're deadlifting and, and drink whiskey and uh and I was like I fucking like this guy <laughs> <laughs> and I started like digging deeper and stuff um, and it, but but that was it actually. Yeah. I'm just my true authentic self, man. <laughs> so anyway, by doing the things that I did, uh, Stan Efferding called me uh, the mad scientist. I'm like, oh, okay, that fits because I was helping him fix some issues at the time. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, that, was, that was the genesis of Kabuki Strength, which is I uh, continued to grow. Uh, we build the best biomechanically sound barbells in the world. And over the next few years, you're going to see that same concept and mentality flow through the rest of what a gym is going to be, which is things that uh, accommodate for variabilities in lifters, leverages, mobility restrictions, all these sort of things. We can tailor this. We can't just shove everybody under the same thing, expect them to move in the same way. You know, principles, the same principles are going to happen, but there's going to be differences and trying to shove everybody through the same thing doesn't necessarily work. And then rapidly accommodating. So as we get into racking and machines and stuff, you'll find that it's going to be able to change and accommodate like super fast. So you can run groups of people through this. So it's really great for basically gym owners that want to operate in a smaller space. Okay. It doesn't work for commercial gyms, yep. but uh, so that you can, you can maximize one of the costs that is going to continually rise, which is real estate. So yeah, our equipment is top of the line and as such, it's spendy, but your your total cost as we develop this whole system will significantly reduce your operational costs and and uh i'm gonna prove that out um so uh and then we've got our movement preparation products that tie into that which is our soft tissue tools shoulder rock movement based stuff uh and then we have our educational stuff which is actually you know this is it's a tie-in it's the only company that actually has principles around loading <laughs> and movement. And that is actually what drives our products. Okay. Um, and they're tied together so that, you know, uh, we're taking scientific principles about training, finding gaps out there and creating equipment to fill those gaps and uh, tying those together. And so, you know, we, we, we do seminars around the globe. Well, virtually right now, obviously. Uh, and we coach people around the globe. Um, and we produce daily educational content uh, that I think is some of the best out there. I challenge anybody that follows our content on our uh, Kabuki virtual coaching uh, page to uh, to find really a better something better out there. And I mean, I'll, I'll back. I mean, I'll back this up first of all because I've consumed it in kind of every in every form. And you do. I mean, you do it and you live it. And was I mean, everything stemmed really from essentially like you training and going like, look, this shit doesn't work. This works. This yeah. Is better. This yeah. Is, right? I mean, and constantly learning. And and that's what's so great about it, though. You know? Well, and it's it, it's also developed. So in the same process, I wanted to perform better. I started developing these relationships with some of the best researchers or clinicians out there. Uh, you'll see a lot of them on our advisory board now, but there's more than that. Um, where I'd start attending seminars, developing relationships. So I started taking a lot of continuing ed in the clinical space, even though like I don't plan on practicing, but just for knowledge. And then next thing you know, I was able to articulate how this actually happens in the loaded movement world, which they didn't so that it helped. I was providing something to them. So the next thing you know, I'm sitting there lecturing, you know, alongside the likes of Dr. Stu McGill, you know, in front of 150 clinicians, you know, or, or uh, Craig Liebenson, who brought you know, some of the best practices in developmental kinesiology to the U.S. Uh, um, you know, I'm flying down tomorrow uh, to uh, to see uh, Dr. Kelly Sturrett, you know, personal friend. We're going to hang out and do some stuff. 
the like that's so it was this it, it was this i'm playing with equipment i'm doing this stuff we're developing coaching methodology but at the same time i'm developing this network and bouncing ideas off of the most intelligent people in their individual disciplines you know yeah. in the yeah. world and that's what helped this whole process and evolve and that's why like our stuff when it comes out nobody's seen it before they're like why where what why do i even need this but then they start using it right and go yeah. oh oh this is a game changer. And uh, that's, that's what we do. Like, I know that sounds again, very egotistical, but like, uh, you know, somebody, nobody was doing anything new in the, that, that part, side of the industry. Let's just keep making, everybody makes a Swiss bar, multi, multi-grip bench bar. Everybody mm-hmm. just keep doing the same thing. No, everybody that's an athlete or a trainer uh, knows they suck. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> like that's just they suck, but everybody makes one. <laughs> Everybody's got one in their gym and they just work around it. Let's choke up on one side so that doesn't uh uh crush my face when I unrack it. You just ex- you just come to expect that these are the things that you have to do to use the equipment. I'm like, come on. Like the stuff that I do is honestly really incredibly simple. Cadillac bar, right? The the best it best bar out there by the way uh, the first time i benched on the cadillac bar i thought it was like you said for how long have we been doing neutral bar stuff right yeah and, and it's never been good but you fucking do it because it's what this was out there <laughs> and me, i remember me and Faruja were like the we're, we're down in california somewhere and, and we're benching with it and it was almost like this moment of oh yeah like holy what, shit what, i i took the demo model to spring training a couple years ago because I, in my experience, I discovered every uh, head strength coach for an MLB team uh, has bad shoulders, can't bench press, right? So I'm like, yeah, let's just cool. let's just put this on the pudding, right? So we met with probably oh, eight or nine teams over the course of a few days because we work with er, only three MLB teams we don't work with, basically. Um, so I'm like, here, try this. Like, oh, you know, there's staffs all around. I, I can't bench, you know. It's a, I'm like, just, just try it. Ooh, that feels good. Put a plate on there. Oh, that feels good. I don't <laughs> put another plate on there and at the time their whole staff their jaws are hanging because they know so every single one of them did this they worked up to a certain number of reps with two plates like and and they're like their staffs same story so i'm just going to tell the coll- <laughs> a collusion of all those stories but did that hurt and they're like no no pain at all it felt great um uh, and uh the background is they haven't benched for years can't even take a bar to their chest without pain and now they're benching 225 for reps first day not a bunch of reps you know three four or five but to a three inch deficit Mm -hmm. right which is so counterintuitive and that's what scares people because they're like oh that bar is going to hurt me but if we stack all those joints and then we add stability at the distal end by taking the weight and putting it below the handle instead of uh, if the bar is anywhere off of uh, a par- uh, parallel to your or perpendicular to your bottle, or it, it, once we get off that perfect axis, it becomes a teeter totter. Mm-hmm. And the teeter totter, just like playground, <laughs> is going to always sit on one side or another. There's a perfect balance point, but it's infinitely perfect, which means you can never in reality find a balance point. So you have incre- incredible instability at your wrist that you're fighting the whole time. And, uh, you know, so we just take that away and make it a swing that always finds center. Put the weight below the center of rotation. It's that simple, okay? And now let's angle those grips, allowing just a little bit of external rotation so you can still cue engagement of it, <laughs> uh, but get you in a neutral position with the shoulder and then the stacking of everything that happens. It actually worked out better in practice with the bar when we when I actually made it than I thought it would, honestly. And it's just phenomenal. Like people that have pain just disappears. Obviously, if you've got an internal rotational deficit, uh, they had greater range of motion. Don't do that. Go fix, go get a boomstick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, clean up, <laughs> spend 90 seconds and fix your internal rotational deficit. Okay. All right. Which is usually uh, one of your pec muscles. Okay. So uh, go in with the boomstick into the pec, clean up your uh, internal rotation. Trap may be a big player because it plays a lot on the shoulder. Boom. Done. Now you can go use it. 
All right. Um, it's I mean, it's it's simple a, stuff. Like it's a combination of all these sorts of things. And it's just like, let's just do it. Like, why is nobody thinking down these routes? It's not complex. Nothing I've ever done is some sort of uh, complexity to it. Once you actually get into it, it's incredibly simple. Just nobody's doing it in that industry. I think what well, the thing is you've taken it because you've been somebody that's obviously but you know, lifted a lot of weight. And it, look, I, I've been lifting for since I was 14 years old. It's so almost 26 years, 25, 26 years now and play pro sports. And I'm at a point where I'm like, eh, I can't just get away with shit. And you know what, like I will say, some of these tools have allowed me to do and what I love and what I preach all the time is obviously, hey, being able to clang and bang, but saving the joints, being able to do this for forever, you know, but being able to do like still lift heavy, yeah. be smart with it. And the tools have allowed, you know, to do that and i think that's so phenomenal because a lot of folks you know you talk to them it's like oh i can't do that shit right and so yeah i, I mean i would highly encourage everybody to these, dig are, the, these are not just used by athletes and strong people like these are used in s some of the best rehab uh and clinical okay. settings around with populations you know old sedentary populations that have never had exposure to weights and this is what they're using um, because of what it does from a movement mechanic standpoint and the fact well, it's only by people that actually understand that load adaption to stress is going to do stuff so you've actually got to do a little bit of loading you know oh d change imagine this <laughs> complex stuff <laughs> <laughs> well, like, you know what i wanted to, to ask you because i mean you you've obviously spent a long time getting to you know lift the weights that you lifted which is still kind of bananas i mean i, I know people you know, always say it's oh it's genetics i'm like yeah there was definitely genetics of role in it but do you realize i took me 30 years to get to my peak that should tell you that i wasn't just that kind of freak like right so yeah, and i was gonna ask you how long i mean obviously like 30 30 years to get to that goal i mean legitimately 30 years to get to this point yeah and, and which is bananas like if and that was and that involves like trailing you know dealing with the the trauma that i did to my body when i was in my early 20s that you know things that i've got to work around but it's all these things that allowed me to do it that's why i was developing all those relationships developing like it was for personal reasons so i could achieve my goals but mm -hmm. it's also now and is is because i want to help change the world in a, in, in the better it sounds like you know, so cliche and like, but when you get someone out of debilitating pain and back to life, you change their life. Absolutely. You change their mental state. You change, and we get messages from all over the world, like every week about stories like this and our staff, like everybody is so pumped to be part of what we're doing because we are adding value and doing something positive in the world. It may not be, you know, figuring out cancer, you know, solving world hunger, you know, but it is actually something really good. And it's something we know how to do and something that we're doing. And that's our goal is it. I've got business plans for the future on this stuff and we don't have the revenue generation side of it figured out. And I don't care. I'm like, We'll figure that out when we get there to how it make it pay for itself. But like, this is what we're going to do. Okay. We're going to be working on integrating clinical with here and like, the, yeah, just, I, I'm not going to get into the specifics because it's <laughs> a little complicated. And, uh, but, um, the, yeah, but it, it doesn't matter. The goal, the, the, the end goal is, is defined. Yeah. And it's not, and it's, and it's not driven monetarily. And that's, I was, just, I was about to say, that, you, that, that's our company is not driven. Yeah. Like so many people are like, oh, you must be doing so good. I'm like, we've been unprofitable almost all of our existence <laughs> because it was, we kept investing back into doing this and trying to build like to, because this is, well, uh, assignments and X books are great, but this is our why. Yeah. Okay. This is our why. And, uh, and so that's what we're chasing is, is, is to be able to, to help people live better. And, if, and the only way that we know how to do that is through, <laughs> through strength. Strength is resilience. Resilience is a better life. And I wrote my book 
just to hit those other factors because the companies, Kabuki Strength, I also have Barefoot, which is a, a minimalist shoe company because I do a lot on foot mechanics. Supplementation, um, which we do some really great stuff with Build Fast Formula. But they're all the physical side of things. And uh, we need to be thinking about all of it because it's all, there is no one that's more important than the other. Yeah. It's the human it's condition. We adapt to stress. So strength and resilience is, is the way of life. And be before I let you go, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering now that, you know, you've hit those, those goals. What is, what is your training that, like now? What have you shifted? Uh, what, what's, what's been changing? Um, I just train to feel good. So I don't, I don't need to add muscle at yeah. this point. I don't need to be, I definitely don't need to be stronger. Uh, I have all the resilience. I have the bone density of like, it's off the charts. Um, I, I have all the benefits of that. And it's at that point, strength development, resilience, the things that we are talking about are actually chasing them as counter to, to health and longevity. And that's really kind of my focus, health, longevity, feeling good. So what my training looks like, uh, I have a three day split. God, split freaking sounds like I'm from the eighties. Uh, oh, that's when I started training, uh, but, uh, yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a pressing, uh, and shoulder, you know, type day. Uh, I have a back day, I have a leg day and, and, uh, in that are mixing in, uh, arms on a lot of times because I'm doing uh, blood flow restriction. Mm -hmm. So I pre prime my upper body system by, uh, uh, doing some arm work, uh, to, to get that fatigue state. Oh, yeah, wow. Went out a little bit. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's smoke coming up out of the outlet behind me right now. I right. lost my light. Apparently I didn't <laughs> like this. <laughs> and uh, um, so, so I do a lot of uh, BFR because it's really, uh, t I I'm trying to limit my workout. So they're 45 minutes, 60 minutes, leg day, just the day I'm hitting a little bit of cardio. So I'll hit the bike first with the, with the, with the cuffs on that way I'm getting a little bit of more metabolic uh, uh, effect. Also, you just get more of a metabolic effect with the uh, BFR bands anyway. Um, and, uh, not the way I recommend to use it. I use, I recommend people have a balance of those sessions with strength sessions and so on. Um, but understand I'm in a very different state than most people. Absolutely. Like I, I have a lot of stuff that I don't even need to touch that most people should be focused on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh man, that smells bad. <laughs> <laughs> Got an electrical fire apparently happened. Well, uh, so if I, if I see flames, man, <laughs> what, what? so so that's, uh, that's, that's it. And the days just float because of my schedule. So, uh, day off happens. I just start repeating, you know, wherever, wherever it picked up at. So, uh, uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. I love it, man. I, I could talk to you. I mean, honestly, we could probably dive into each one of these topics and talk about it for, for damn days. Um, for sure. You know, and, and well, I'm, we I'm could do well. another one sometime. I, absolutely. We, we definitely, definitely will. Um, Nate, thank you so much, man. But before, you know, before I let you go, please let, I mean, I, I, I want to encourage everybody to, you know, not only follow Chris and, and Kabuki strength and everything they do, because seriously, and you, you guys will see me when I do videos, pretty much a lot of the stuff is like their equipment when, when I'm shooting videos and you see it on IG and YouTube and everything else. Uh, but the content is, is phenomenal too. So, you know, but what, where can they find out more about you? Where can they get the book? Yeah. Um, and, and anything else that you'd like to share as far as like resources? Yeah. So great central point uh, is just my personal website, chrisduffin.com. It'll have links to Kabuki Strength, uh, Barefoot, uh, Build Fast, and anything uh, future endeavors. Uh, there's also a cool link. Uh, if you don't have an Audible account, you can get a free copy of my book along with another book by signing up uh, for an account through there. So I love promoting it uh, just because it, it is a great deal. Obviously, there's some incentives and stuff there. It's a great deal. Um, and if not, you can buy it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, basically any e-retailer. Uh, I think even I saw it on Target.com the other day or something. Um, uh, uh, I'm most uh, active or only active on LinkedIn and Instagram okay. uh, are the two platforms that I actually interact, uh, interact on. And... Uh, I definitely highly recommend that you check out the Kabuki Virtual Coaching Instagram. 
um, because that's where the educational content populates. Actually, I think a lot of it's now populating on my personal uh, LinkedIn as well. Uh, so you can see the daily stuff uh, going on there. Um, and then, yeah, anything that you want to explore, um, you'll find in those avenues. So that's, uh, that's it. Uh, Kawuki's got a YouTube channel if that's your preferred, all the same stuff's on there as well. Um, so uh, yeah, whatever your whatever your media type is, I think we've got it covered. Choose your own, choose your own adventure. Yeah, um, I, I really hope that obviously that that this stuff kind of comes back to normal, so we can also schedule uh, one of your events at, at you know at Vigor. That's that's. I my- really would love to do that, Luca. I yeah. think you, it's a great place to for us to to hit that up. Let's plan on that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate it. This was phenomenal. Um, and we will repeat it for sure. All right. Let's do that. I'll talk to you later, man. All right. Sounds good, brother.